<laughs> Sometimes things just suck the life out of you. Some small features, stuff that was already working, just suddenly breaks everything and take all the life out of you and turns you into a leftover husk of a dead body programmer somewhere in the road. As some of you might know, I've released my game in early access a couple of months ago and I've been working on it ever since then, trying to come up with new updates and new features and fixing bugs and at the same time trying to see a little bit the feedback, what kind of impression I make, trying to promote my game on different um, forums or Discord or Reddit and see what people think. I've also pushed my game a little bit to some influencer and other YouTubers to see what they think. But it's kind of fun. Uh, I could see getting, I could see getting quite a few hours of enjoyment out of it. So. It really and to be honest, the um, general feedback I've gotten was pretty cold, like single digit Kelvin cold. On one hand, I was kind of expecting something like that. I wasn't expecting like a rush for a game that's not even finished yet. And uh, I also think like that so that I can sleep at night. But nevertheless, I've taken all the feedback I've gotten and I've tried to put it to good use. I spent a lot of time analyzing all the results I got from the feedback or the influencer or the YouTubers that actually talked to me about my game. And I appreciate everything I got. And I would say most of the comments I had turned around the fact that the game didn't look very good. And that's kind of true, but at the same time, when you think about it, there's plenty of games out there that do really well, even with, well, allegedly poor graphics. I'm thinking of like Undertale or Binding of Isaac or even worse, Dwarf Fortress. Of course, these games have a lot of other stuff going for them, but what I mean is that it didn't stop people getting into it in the first place. So what's different? So I started looking at screenshots of the most popular indie games and I compared them to the best screenshot I thought I had for my game. And well, the result is surprising. I mean, you can tell that my game looks boring. So. I tried really hard to figure out what's wrong with it because I think the game itself when you play it is pretty fun at least I like it so if I like it someone else out there for sure must like it so I need to make it look just as interesting as it is in real life and I'm not quite sure how to do that I'm not a very creative person I'm not an artist so I need to figure out logically what I can do to improve it so I decided that for the next update, I need to work on two things. First, I'm gonna try to take the screenshots and make them pop, make them more interesting, make them look great. And I don't know what that means. That means maybe moving the buttons around. That means maybe changing the screens. That means adding new graphic, making animations. I don't know, but I need to figure something. So for the first part of this, it was, well, not easy, but what I did is that I booted up Krita with a bunch of screenshots that I had and I started looking at how I can rearrange stuff without even worrying about how to implement that in the game. Because I really believe that you should always start with the top level stuff and then figure out a way to do it in your code. Even if it turns out that this is going to make your code look ugly, the end result is really what's most important for the player. One of the things I realized while I was looking at the screenshots of other games and my game is that at first I took a lot of screenshots without the Fog of War because I thought the Fog of War was boring and people wanted to see more planets and ships and shooting and stuff like that. But comparing screenshot, I realized that the Fog of War, that's kind of a blue cloud-like thing around the ship, kind of makes the screenshot a little bit more colorful and by that a little bit more interesting. But right now the Fog of War is just a plain blue background and it's still not quite enough to make it look interesting. So I thought maybe I can take the Fog of War and 
make it more interesting, add more color. That's something I really have a lot of creativity to go with. I mean, like the stars, the planets, they're, they're kind of, you know, already decided. But the fog of war could be anything, right? And it can add a lot of interest to a screenshot. So I worked in Krita, I make a couple of different prototypes, and I came up with two prototypes that I really liked. The first one is what I call the fancy version, with um, like the fog of war looking really cloud-like and having a lot of details in it and all that. And the other one was something I called the more practical one. Because even me, as a player, I realized that the fog of war could have some more features. Right now, it just shows you the places you haven't explored. And to show you places you've explored that are not in your scanner range, I just use like a ghost image of the uh, planets and ships you've encountered before. You still don't really know the range of your own scanner. And if you've explored a big part of the galaxy, it's kind of hard sometimes to tell where your scanner starts and where the explored, remembered background start. So I decided to go for the second version with a more practical look where you really see a delimitation of your scanner range and you have like some kind of overlay to show the parts you've explored. And I really liked both versions, but I couldn't really figure out which one I wanted to try first in the game. So I went back to the drawing board and came up with a third version that had a mix of all of those features. Because one of the things that people said is that they really like the fog version or the cloud version, but clouds in space, it that doesn't really make sense. So I tried to go back and redesign the cloud to be something more like a, a glitch in the matrix or something. Um, I don't know if I've pulled it off. Maybe I'll revisit it at some point, but I, I got kind of what I was hoping. I mean, <laughs> I'm not the best at using Krita, but I, I'm trying, I'm trying. Now I was stuck with how am I going to implement this in the game? Uh, recently, I've been playing with the tile map system in Godel for other stuff, and I figured this could be a good way of implementing the um, area of the scanner and the highlight of the uh, remembered part of the map. I already have code iterating over all the tiles the player has been and toggling the remembered ship and the ghost image and highlighting the uh, scanner part. So I just need to place the code for the tile map a little bit everywhere and let the auto tiling system take care of uh, like the border of the scanner and the remembered highlights and all of that. And Yes, it took me probably an afternoon and everything was working fine. Or so I thought. Until <laughs> I decided that it was time to see how it looked on my phone. And I have an old tablet that I use for testing. I really like to use it because it's pretty old. It was already weak when I bought it. So if it's running on this, I know it's going to be running on pretty much any Android phone out there. And well, after five minutes, when I was about on the fifth frame of the game, I realized that there was something wrong. I've done a video before about how to use Godot Profiler to see what's wrong with your code, and you can check out the video in the corner there. But in this case, the profiler didn't give me much. As you can see, the idle frame is like 400 millisecond, but the um, actual script time is barely nothing. So what's happening between the script time and the idle frame? Well, Godot is really good to tell you what's happening inside the game, but it doesn't have many tools, as far as I know, to debug what's happening on the graphic card. And it turns out that the issue with my tile map system is in the graphics. I could debug on PC, but on PC it's running fine, and sometimes the bottleneck on a device is not the same as the bottleneck on another device. So I wanted to try first to profile on device to see what's happening. And turns out that my phone is using an old ARM uh, GPU. So I went on the ARM website and I downloaded a tool set for profiling the graphic capabilities of your phone. Of course, it required me to do a little bit of back and forth and modifying some stuff and reading a lot of documentation. But in the end, I managed to set up a custom build process in Godot, run the Gradle, modify a bit my configuration so that it would use the libraries to debug the uh, graphic performance 
from the ARM utilities I installed, and I managed to get um, pretty good information about what's happening on the GPU of my tablet when I'm playing the game. And turns out I have about 2,600 draw calls. And on Android, that's a big no-no. A lot of 3D programmers will tell you now that draw calls are nearly costless on modern GPUs. And that's mostly true. That's why on PC, I don't see a difference. But on Android, it's still very much a big issue if you go anywhere above like 400 draw calls. And so 2,600 is, yeah, quite a lot. So I profiled on my PC so that I could see every draw call one by one. And when you look at it, you realize that it's drawing every tile of the tile map one by one. And uh, that's really not good. I was hoping that Godot was going to be able to do some kind of, I don't know, batching or optimization for that, but apparently it's not. And so I had to go back to the drawing board and find a way to draw my tiles at least much faster and with not so many draw calls. I had to think about it for quite some time. I, I spent probably nearly a day just thinking about the potential solutions for this problem. And I came up with two ideas. You see, I need three things. I need to display some kind of overlay for the unexplored part of the game. Now I want an overlay for the remembered but explored part of the game. And finally, I want some border around the active area of your ship scanner. Now, I already use a trick for my unexplored part where I render a huge sprite and I punch hole in it using a mask texture that's the size of my tile map. So I have a map that's 80 tiles wide and 80 tiles high. So I have a texture 80 by 80 and each pixel represent whether or not the alpha should be on or off at this specific tile. And then I have a shader that just goes and um, change the alpha of my sprite based on where I am in the tile map. That works really well and it's a single draw call and the shader is pretty cheap, so it's very performant. So I was thinking I could do something similar for the uh, remembered part of the map where I will just punch holes for the active scanner part of the map. The problem is that I don't know how I can use this to render the side or the contour of my active scanner. But I figured that maybe since this only change when you change your scanner, then I could maybe render this in a texture using the auto tiling so that I can after that use just the texture. So it was a little bit of a tricky kind of solution, but I thought it might work well. Now the other thing I figured is that maybe I can implement my own auto tiling system where I would generate a mesh dynamically inside GDescript and then set the UV to a texture atlas and just calculate which UV I have to use, whether it's the uh, remembered or the unexplored or the contour of my active scanner or something. And this idea was really appealing to me, but I was a little bit worried about the performance of it because each of my levels are 80 by 80 tiles big I need a lot of information for each of those tiles. For example, if I want to use index buffer rendering, I need six indexes, four vertices, and four UV coordinates for each tile in my levels. That's like four times four times six times four times four data points that I have to put and send to the GPU every time I need to update my tile map. So I did what every insane person would do, and I decided to implement both methods and see which one is fastest. Of course, I didn't take the time to implement it in the game properly with all the doodads and stuff. I just wanted to see which rendering would be best. So I created temporary scenes with the most basic setup I could think of. And I was happy to see that the dynamic mesh solution wasn't that much slower than the mask occlusion technique I was using for the uh, unexplored part of the level. So I decided to take the generated mesh idea and implement it in the game. And finally I got it working, but my pain wasn't over yet. 
Because once I finally got it working on PC, I quickly installed it on my tablet to see how much the performance had improved. And oh woe me, wasn't my pain to discover that I was still running at 2 or 3 FPS. I was like, what the actual F? I got down like 2000 draw call. My FPS should be at like 30 right now. <sighs> so I booted up again the Godot profiler to realize that now the rendering was fine, but my GDescript script was incredibly slow. So what the hell happened? It seems that every time we move, I have to update all the tiles around the player ship. And if you have a scanner that's a little bit on the bigger side, that's easily 20 tile wide of stuff you have to update. So if you update it in a square, that's about 400 tiles you have to check and update if needed. But for me, a 400 iteration loop is not that much. And it, I mean, it could be, it, uh, it would show on the profiler, but it shouldn't like put my FPS to like two or three. That, that doesn't make sense to me. So there has to be something else that I'm doing that's completely killing the performance. There's a couple of other methods that I called hundreds of times and they're not taking nearly as much. So what's wrong with the way I'm doing my generation of my mesh. Now I found some subtleties that probably was killing my performance. For example, when you're generating a mesh, you can't use regular arrays because Godot expect you to send it um, some pooled array, which is a different type of arrays in Godot that are supposed to be more optimized. The thing is, is that those pooled arrays are um, not passed by reference. So since I was caching already the UV array, but as a pooled vector2 array, well, every time I'm writing it or every time I was passing it to a method, then it was being copied over and over and over and over, more likely like 400 times. And like I said, that's an array that's 80 by 80 by four, which means more than 25,000 indices inside this array. So copying it 400 times in the memory is probably not good. So what I did is that instead of caching this as a pool array, I decided to cache it as a normal array that's passed by reference everywhere in Godot. And I only turn it into a pooled array when I need to update the mesh at the very end of all the update process. And just doing this finally brought my FPS back to something like 15, 20 or so. It's still not great, but like I said, this tablet is already really bad. So on anything else, it's okay performance. And on my other Android phone, I have like 40 FPS or something. And of course on PC, I don't see any lag or any drop in FPS. So for now, I'm gonna call it done, but I'll probably need to revisit it because there's still something wonky about the fact that it's taking so long to update the simple scanner. But that was such a big pain. And I've been working on this for like two weeks and it's not even finished yet. And it's something that was already working. I just wanted to make it more pretty. So that was a really big pain and um, I didn't really enjoy it, but I'm glad I discovered a lot of new stuff about Godot and about tile map in general, and about the fact that I'm probably not going to be using any Godot tile map for anything serious in the future. Also, you might have noticed during the intro that to keep me sane, I've taken to drinking some insane stuff, like this <laughs> orange vanilla Coca-Cola that I've been dying to try and I'm just going to drink in front of you now. <sniffs> ah, the sweet taste of orange crush mixed with some vanilla essence and regular Coca-Cola. It's not the greatest, I'll have to admit, but at least it puts a smile on my face. That's it for this week. Thank you for tuning in. Sorry for the lack of update recently. The kids have been on a summer holiday and they've been at home all day because of the coronavirus. So recording has been quite hard. That doesn't mean I haven't been working. Like you see, I've been spending a lot of time trying to improve the look and feel of my game. And I'm really looking forward to sharing with you more of the improvements I've done over the last few weeks. So until then, see you all in my next video. Bye.